Uh, well, is, do you agree that there, it seems that there is, uh, has been kind of a growing respect for the difficulty of, of uh, explaining consciousness, subjective experience in a certain sense? I, I mean, uh, you know, I think when Daniel Dennett's book on consciousness came out, I don't know, it's probably been 20 years now or more, there was a sense, well, certainly that book tried to convey a sense, that this is no big mystery. Yeah, and the book had a lot of enthusiastic readers, and I think yeah. some of them to, uh, took it to be like, okay, this is where philosophy has gotten no big mystery. Yeah, it seems to me that the the bulk of both actual academic writing in philosophy since then, and kind of popular writing, has since then has been a little more respectful of the difficulty of the problem, explaining. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, why there is subjective experience if in principle a mm -hmm. physical body could mm -hmm. do, could, you know, if, if in principle a, a strictly physical squirrel could do all the things a squirrel does, mm -hmm. you know, why does a squirrel have to, as they presumably do, feel pain when they are, mm -hmm. you know, attacked or something? Um, these kinds of questions, I, I think, have gotten more play uh over the last couple of decades, I'm wondering if you agree that that's the case, and 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 if you do, if you have a, a, an explanation as to why. <laughs> well, I I think that when Daniel Dennett's book came out, and it was you know around about the time, as I recall, that Stephen Pinker's book How the Mind Works came out. Mm -hmm. There was a sort of cluster of these books. Late late nineties, I guess. Yeah, the late nineties when it, when it was as if oh problem solved, you know, let's move on. But as you say, twenty years later, Bob, there's you know, sometimes I think if I had um, a dollar for every time I read the words, I've got a theory of consciousness, mm -hmm. I'd be rich by now. But I think things have got more respectful in the sense that I think a lot of people realize now that the problem is very, is very complex. What is, what, do you even articulate what do you mean when you say consciousness? It seems to mean different things to different people who write these books. Um, and, and there's a realization, I think, that there's so many of these books have been coming out and none of them have been universally accepted. So there's clearly, in, it, we are at the beginning of something, not at the end of it. And mm -hmm. my sense is that, as it were, the science of trying to understand consciousness will be a project for, I, I personally believe it, this will be a project for hundreds of years. Um, and I think, I think because, in, in, to me, I, I believe that this is a hard problem. I mean, whether you take it literally in David Chalmers' sense, this is a very hard problem. Mm -hmm. How, do, in the attempts, most of the, the books at least are coming out by scientists are attempts to explain um, uh, it from it. You know, how do we explain the it of consciousness increasingly from some sort of flow of information at the neuronal level? It seems that information theory is the big goer, these, at least a very fashionable goer, in terms of understanding and trying to explain what consciousness is. Um, I guess from my personal point of view, uh, I have less interest in the question of what consciousness is because I'm not even sure that we can really answer that any more than we can answer the question, what is love? I think there will be endless speculations, endless insights into that question for as long as humans are around. I'm interested in the issue of what are the responsibilities of conscious beings? If we are conscious, which I think we are, um, what are the responsibilities that we face when we are as conscious beings? And, I mean, th this has, I think, Patricia Churchland once talked about this question. She said she was less interested in the idea anymore of what free will is, but more really in when a person has free, when does a person have free will, and when can they be held responsible with that free will. So, for instance, do you have free will if you're drunk out of your mind? Mm -hmm. Do you have, I, can you be considered to have free will if you're, um, you're in a state of extreme post-traumatic stress syndrome, can you be considered to, you know, have to, to be in have free will if you're in a state of utter rage because you've just found out, you know, that your partner has left you? Um, and so I think consciousness is 
is in the same class as free will and obviously it's allied with free will is if we are conscious, when are we conscious and what is our responsibilities as conscious beings? And I think that's a far more fascinating set of questions than endless quibbling about what is consciousness and how does it arise. Okay. Notwithstanding that, let me raise one more uh, piece of endless quibbling uh, uh, about uh, one, one more question about consciousness uh, and physics. It's it's this that I think um, you know in the background here sometimes is the question of uh, which is more fundamental: what we think of as the physical world out there or the subjective world in mm. here. And and I think uh, like for example, one view that's I think commonly implied by scientists. They, they may not even think have this very well articulated in their minds, but I think it's kind of implicit in their view, uh, especially behavioral scientists, is that subjective experience is just kind of a shadow cast by the physical workings. So like, you know, the, the neurons corresponding or, or, or all the physical information processing corresponding to my withdrawing my hand from a flame leads to the feeling of pain, but the pain is not the driving thing. The driving thing is the physical information in my arm. That's what gets me to withhold, to pull the arm back. And and this is, of course, one of the things that leads to the question of, well, then why is subjective experience here if it's not doing anything? So, But anyway, in that view, it's like the physical stuff that's fundamental. Subjective experience is kind of a shadow that's cast. There is the alternative view that in some sense, consciousness or subjective experience is more fundamental than the world out there. And this has cropped up occasionally in interpretations of quantum physics. You know, th this issue of like whether, you know, it seems to be the case that like measuring the electron forces what was just a wave of probabilities to collapse into more definite form. And some people I, I don't think this is a majority view in physics, but some people have taken that to mean that it's actually the act of observing. It's the conscious being that forces the collapse of the wave functioning. Again, I, the wave function, again, I don't think that's a majority view, but in any event, it it shows you how you could start viewing the consciousness as the more fundamental thing, the thing that brings reality into existence. Now, do I remember correctly that you have expressed views on this on this subject or am I over am I reading too much into some of your past comments on the question of which is more fundamental well I think I think this question of which is the more fundamental is also very difficult because you know in a sense what do you mean by that right. um, I I do not believe that we that physical definitions of consciousness are going to get to the things that I believe are the essence of consciousness. I believe that however consciousness comes into being, that like life, once it is, once it is there, it is, um, it is a fundamental aspect of reality and it needs its own discourse and language. Just as I was saying earlier, you know, once life comes into being, you start talking about giraffes and elephants and peacocks and dolphins as things in an, in themselves. You don't keep reverting to the language of molecular biology. And I think consciousness is like that. Once it comes into being, however it comes into being, um, I think once it's there, it is, as it were, a phenomena that can no longer be um, adequately described in terms of the laws of physics which isn't to say that studying the underlying structures might not show us interesting things. Um, and, and, and a big part of the reason I'm committed to this is, is for the same reason going back to Descartes, uh, who I think gets a very bad rap in the history of science. I think Descartes actually a very extraordinary thinker. And one of the things that Descartes, you know, Descartes the one who's, credited with the dividing the world into what he called the res extensa, of the physical realm of matter in motion and what he called the res cogitans, the realm of human's thoughts, feelings, emotions, and ultimately also for him religious experience. I'm committed to the um, ontological um, primacy of the, um, of the res cogitans. It doesn't necessarily mean it's more primary than the res extensa, but I think it is, it is a not-derivative realm. 
And the reason this matters, I think, is for the reason that it has always mattered, which is the moral dimension. If, if we do not have um, the ability as moral animals, to use your phrase, Robert, to genuinely make moral decisions, then the whole realm of ethics becomes a sham. So if we are just being guided by the laws of physics, then how does, how is there any real sense of moral accountability? How does moral choice act? And I'm committed to the notion that we must be, have moral choice. We must have free will to make decisions um, and that we therefore have responsibility to ourselves, to other beings and to the wider universe to think about and try to make good moral decisions. And if we are just simply enactments of the laws of physics, then I don't see how we can have choice. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think this idea is so difficult to get to go away. Mm -hmm. You know, every time you see some sort of reductionist account of things, when you burrow into it, it, it just delides over the notion that there is genuine free will. Mm 